Greetings, everybody. Gleekon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. Uh, we are continuing our journey through the Tides of Darkness novel. Um, largely, we are centered in what would be considered Act 3 of the actual game, which is the, the campaign that's happening in Quel'Thalas in the uh, High Elven Land, what will become the Blood Elf Lands. So stay a while and listen to this one. It's Chapter 13. Quiet now. No noise, Vil'jin warned his brethren. They had made their way quickly through the trees, deep into Quel'Thalas, but now his sharp nose warned him that elves were somewhere nearby. Accordingly, he slowed, setting each foot carefully on the branch he trod, axes held tightly in his hands to avoid any chance of their rattling as he moved. He did not want the elves to know they were there, not yet. All around him, the other Amani trolls crept just as quietly, weapons at the ready. Most of them wore big grins, revealing their triangular teeth, and Zul'jin understood completely. They were within the elves' own homeland, preparing to attack them in the one place they assumed themselves safe. He could almost taste the anticipation. The elves had plagued them far too long. Ever since the pale-skinned, pointy-eared interlopers had first appeared thousands of years ago, stealing territories from the vast Amani Empire, they had claimed mastery of the land's forests, as if they could match a troll for speed, stealth, and dexterity. But the elves had several strong advantages. The greatest of this had been their accursed magic. The trolls had never encountered such magic before and had not had a way to counter the elves' mystical attacks or breach their arcane defenses. Fortunately, there's some parallel there, like in terms of like more advanced technologies. Like There's definitely a, a sad indigenous peoples kind of vibe to the trolls. Fortunately, the trolls had significantly outnumbered them and could overwhelm the hated elves by sheer numbers, and then the elves had allied with the humans. Together, the two pale races had shattered the Amani Empire. They had laid waste to troll fortresses and slaughtered thousands of his ancestors. Zul'jin snarled at the thought, the sound fortunately absorbed by his thick scarf. Before the war, his people had been numerous and powerful and had controlled much of the land. Afterward, they had been scattered, a shadow of their former selves, and never possessed the sheer numbers to reclaim their stolen heritage. Until now. The Horde had promised them vengeance, and Zul'jin believed them. The orc leader Doomhammer had honor about him, the honor of a strong leader secure in his own power. He would not play Zul'jin false, and he had vowed to help them restore the Amani Empire. Already Zul'jin had started that task. He was the first forest troll since those terrible wars to reunite the tribes. One by one he had challenged the other tribe leaders and defeated them, whether at combat or at racing or at some other task, and all had bowed before him, pledging themselves and their tribes to his rule. The forest trolls were a single people once more, and with the Horde's help they would wipe the world clean of humans and elves alike, and rule the forests once more. The orcs showed no interest in trees, and Zul'jin suspected they would occupy the valleys and plains of the world. Let them. All he wanted was the woods. And I wonder, I know the Amani still exist, you can do the Zul'aman uh, dungeon for instance, but I wonder how the Dark Spear trolls become the ones that really become part of the Horde, and why the Amani are not. But first they had to take them from the elves, and that would be a pleasure. Even now his nose twitched, warning him they were close. Zul'jin halted, raising one hand to signal a stop, and felt more than heard his brethren pausing as well. He peered down through the leaves, his sharp eyes piercing the gloom easily, and waited. There! A flicker of movement appeared below, something passing into his range of vision on the forest floor. Whatever it was, it was cloaked in browns and greens like the trees, but he caught a glimpse of paler color beneath, and it made no sound as it stepped, walking across leaves and brushes as if they were smooth stone. An elf! Another emerged behind the first, and then a third, and a fourth. Soon a full hunting party was passing below, ten in all. They did not look up. Secure in their own forest, it did not occur to the elves to be wary. Zildjian grinned. This would be easier than he had thought. Signaling his kin, he returned his axes to their sheaths and dropped quietly to a lower branch and swung from that one down to a third. Now he was less than twenty feet above the elves and could see them clearly, their cloaks streaming behind them. 
They carried the accursed bows and arrows of their kind slung across their backs, but their hands were empty. They did not suspect what lurked above them. Zuljin dropped down from the trees, drawing his axes as he moved. He landed easily on the balls of his feet right between two elves and slashed at both before they could react. His first blow took the one facing him in the throat, while his second blow bit deep into the skull of the one before him. Both fell blood spraying from the leaves. The other elves turned, shouting in surprise, and reached for their own weapons. But now Zildjian's brethren fell upon them, axes and daggers and clubs at the ready. The elves twisted and dodged, desperate to get enough space to draw their swords or string their bows. But the trolls did not give them the chance. The elves were quick, but the trolls were taller and stronger, and grabbed the rangers before they could get away. One elf did manage to twist free. He took two quick steps away and turned, using a tree for cover. Zildjian expected the elf to go for his bow, but instead... His hands fell to a long horn hanging from his belt. The ranger lifted the horn to his lips and blew a mighty blast, but it was cut short as one of the other trolls stabbed the elf in the stomach, and the blast turned to a faint wheeze as the ranger collapsed, blood spilling from his mouth as well as his gut. The skirmish was over. Zuljin reached down and cut an ear from the first elf he'd slain, adding it to the pouch at his waist. Later he would dry the ear and string it onto his necklace with the others to show his prowess, but for now, they had other tasks. Delightful. Gum, he told his kin, who were laughing and amusing themselves by tearing off ears and hair and other parts from the fallen elves. Several had appropriated the elves' long, slender swords as trophies. Such weapons were pretty enough, but not sturdy enough for the trolls' powerful thrusts. More elves be coming, Sulajan warned them. Back to the trees. We laid them on a chase. Keep them busy. He grinned, and his brethren answered with fierce expressions of their own. Then we kill them all. Quickly the forest trolls leaped up, grabbing low branches with their long-fingered hands and pulling themselves up into the cover of the leaves. They swung up and away, leaving the bodies and the blood behind, their eyes alert and nose, noses sniffing for any hint of approaching elves. Zuljin was not worried. He knew the other elves would come soon, and they would be ready. It had been a long time since he had spilled elf blood, and the brief battle had renewed his thirst for more. His kin felt the same, and many were snapping their jaws and flexing their fingers, eager for another fight with the pale-skinned elves. Soon, Zuljin assured himself quietly, soon they would have a chance to kill as many elves as they wanted. The forest would run red with blood, and the elves would know the fall of their own empire, just as the trolls had felt theirs die so long ago, and he, Zuljin, would be responsible. He would hold the Elf King's head high so it could see its people's death just before he devoured it whole. He could hardly wait. Is it ready? Gul'dan asked impatiently. A short distance away, Chokal shook both his heads. The massive ogre grunted and shoved his enormous shoulder, pushing the last runestone fragment another foot across the thickly grassed clearing. No, it is ready, he called out, strengthening and rubbing at the shoulder with one hand. Gul'dan nodded. It had taken them several hours to dig out a single runestone, shatter the monolith into several still enormous pieces, and carry five of them here to this clearing, and then several more hours to position the stones just right and inscribe the circle and the pentagram between them. Fortunately, Doomhammer had given them the use of several regular ogres for the labor, and Chogal was able to communicate with his stupid one-headed kin more easily than any work could. The runestone fragments were large and dense, but two ogres could lift them, whereas it would have taken dozens of orcs to budge each stone. Gul'dan wondered idly how the elves had gotten the original unbroken stones to their locations in the first place. Most likely magic. Or perhaps they'd used slave labor as well. The forest trolls were nearly as powerful as the ogres and far smarter, so they would have been able to follow more detailed instructions. At least the stones were in place now. Gul'dan gestured and three other orc warlocks took their places beside three of the runestone pieces. It was a good thing Doomhammer had not killed all of them, or this ritual would not have stood even a chance of working. As it was, Gul'dan thought it would succeed, but he was not completely sure. Still, if it failed, he was fairly certain he would survive unscathed. He nodded to Chokal, who called out to the ogres clustered off to one side. After a moment of jostling and pushing and grunting, one of them stepped forward. Chokal barked a command, and the ogre, shrugging, slouched into the space between the stones. It stood at the center of the pentagram and waited, motionless. One good thing about ogres was that they could stand still when required. 
Indeed, when not given an order and not looking for food, ogres could stand for hours as motionless as statues. Gul'dan had often wondered if they had somehow evolved from rocks. Kind of, yeah. It would explain their dense hides as well as their utter stupidity. Returning his mind to the task at hand, Gul'dan raised his arms and called forth the dark energies his demon masters had granted him back on Draenor. The energy crackled about him and he fed it into the runestone fragment directly before him. Chokal had taken the final place, and he and the other warlocks added their magic as well, each powering a single stone. When all five stones hummed with power, almost vibrating from the energies they contained, Gul'dan spoke a short incantation and concentrated. More energy arced from his fingertips into his, his rune stone, but this time, the energy then flickered through his stone and onto the nearest stone on his left. Nor did the energy stop there. It passed to the next stone, and then the next, and then the next, and finally back to his, linking all five in an array of dancing, bristling magic. The air itself seemed to darken above the altar, and it felt thick with energy, the way the sky did right before a massive storm. The ogre still stood unmoving, though Gul'dan thought he saw a glimmer of fear in its eyes. Oh good, Cho'gal had picked the smart one. Oh good, he's afraid. Now that the stones had power, Gul'dan turned the energy toward their center and toward the towering figure standing there. Bolts of dark energy shot from his stone and struck the ogre full in the chest, surrounding it with a blazing dark aura. The other runestone fragments lent their strength, and the ogre almost disappeared within the dark glow that filled the space between the stones. More energy danced within that sphere, somehow feeding on itself, and now they could make out only the faintest hint of the ogre's outline. Gul'dan was sure he could feel his arms trembling from fatigue and magical drain, but excitement kept him quivering with energy. After a few minutes, the shadowy glow began to fade. Slowly it dimmed, and the figure within stood out in greater detail. Still the ogre towered above them all, except Chokal. But something about the creature had changed. Gul'dan waited impatiently for the glow to dissipate enough for him to see into the sphere. Finally it did so, winking out completely in an instant, and Gul'dan had his first real look at the creature his altar of storms had created. It was still clearly an ogre, though even larger than before, and somehow its proportions had shifted. Its arms were not quite as long, its legs not quite so bowed, and it held itself different, more alert. And, of course, there were the two heads. Back on Draenor, two-headed ogres were incredibly rare. They were bigger and stronger than their kin and more coordinated. They were venerated, and Chokal was the first seen in generations. Even more rare, he had proven intelligent enough to become a mage. Gul'dan had found the two-headed ogre when he was still young and had trained him carefully. Chokal had proven a valuable assistant and a powerful warlock in his own right and still remained with Gul'dan to this day. And now it seemed Chokal was not alone. The new two-headed ogre turned and stared at Gul'dan, somehow realizing he was in charge. "'What am I?' it demanded, one head speaking while the other looked around. Its language skill was far greater than a normal ogre's as well. "'You are an ogre,' Gul'dan replied. "'Perhaps an ogre mage.' "'An ogre mage?' the new ogre's other head asked. "'What does that mean?' Gul'dan found himself explaining about magi and warlocks and shaman and other workers of magic. And I am one of these, the new ogre asked. Possibly, Gul'dan's eyes narrowed. There is a simple test. He stooped and lifted a single leaf from the ground, handing it to the two-headed creature. Take this. The ogre took the leaf with surprising skill, showing that his dexterity had dramatically increased as well. Now concentrate on the idea of fire, of heat and flame, Gul'dan told the ogre. The ogre frowned with both faces studying the leaf, then it nodded slightly, first one head and then the other. Good, Gul'dan spoke softly, not wanting to break the creature's concentration. Now bring that flame to life. Let it claim the leaf, the fire licking across it, the heat warming your skin, almost burning your fingers. He watched as a spark appeared near the middle of the leaf, and rapidly grew to a small flame that spread hungrily. The leaf shriveled, turning dark and brittle in seconds as the fire consumed it. The breeze carried it away, and the ogre glanced up, meeting Gul'dan's eyes with both its own pairs, its double gaze bright. I am an ogre mage, then, yes? It sounded pleased. One head grinned, the other smiled slightly, though it seemed puzzled. Yes, Gul'dan agreed, also pleased. 
You are one of us. What does that mean, one of us? The creature asked next, its less exuberant head frowning. What do I do with this gift? Gul'dan explained about the horde. He also told the ogre about the need to conquer here, and about the other races they had already faced their, in their quest. The ogre mage listened quietly, absorbing every detail. You created me, the ogre said at last. It was not a question, but Gul'dan nodded. I am your creature then, the ogre affirmed. I will serve you. Your cause is my cause. Tell me what to do. Inside, Gul'dan rejoiced. It was exactly as he'd hoped. By shaping the two-headed ogre with his own magic, he had formed a bond between them. The creature was completely loyal. Outwardly, however, he was careful not to show too much glee. Instead, he simply gestured for Chogal to approach. This is Chogal. Gul'dan explained. He, like you, is a trusted assistant and an ogre mage. He will explain what we are doing here, and he will give you a name of your own. The new ogre bowed its heads. Thank you, master, the more somber head said before the creature followed Chogal away. Gul'dan knew his assistant would set the new ogre mage to, working, to work powering the altar again, and with each use they would gain another two-headed ogre. He knew he could not expect most of them to be Ogre Magi, that was too much to hope for, but if even one in ten possessed the necessary intelligence, he would be able to assemble a second altar and power that one as well. Gul'dan chuckled. He would transform every ogre in the horde if Doomhammer did not stop him, and that's kind of how it works like in the game. And why would he? As far as Doomhammer knew, he was getting bigger, stronger warriors. The war chief would never suspect that these new creatures were completely loyal to Gul'dan and not him and Gul'dan would make sure his new servants did not reveal their true loyalties too soon, only when the time was right, and then Doomhammer would discover that there was a new faction within the Horde, one he could not so easily destroy or cast aside. Gul'dan laughed again and turned away. Chokal would handle the rest of the process here. He had other tasks to oversee, ones that would later lead to his finally claiming the power that lay waiting for him elsewhere. All right, um, so we, we're pushing, I think we're getting closer to the end of the campaign in Quelth Alas. Um, I can't imagine they can spend too much more time in it, but maybe uh, we have just about every type of, of uh, troop. Like I said, we still have um, goblins and dwarven sappers of demolitionists to technically discuss. Um, and this book, this book has been pretty good about talking about all types. The mages haven't technically come in and joined them yet. Um, and we have the zeppelins and the subs, like I said on the last episode. But for the most part, we're, we're, we're trucking along. All right, this episode's in the pipes, five by five. And that's it. I'll see you on the next episode of Lore of Warcraft. Thanks for watching.